So, about seven years ago, I picked up my dad's old camera, a long-distance microphone like you get in Metal Gear Solid 2, and fought tooth and nail with Windows Movie Maker to try and make my first episode of Curiosity's sake. Then I said fuck it and got better equipment. Anyway, I just wanted to start this episode by thanking those who supported this show in so many ways over the course of the past seven years. I'm legitimately thankful for every minute that my audience has given me and all of those other channels who believed in my content enough to be on screen with me and of course to Loz who sacrificed his mind, body and dignity to help me bring my vision to life. But Ugly Martians is a short-lived TV series from 2001 to 2003, give or take. It lasted a single season and had such a cultural impact at the time that I thought it was just a toy line for months before knowing that a show even existed. This show was quite aggressively advertised in the UK for about a year, which is where I first heard of it. They had toys and trading cards and other stupid things, including a dance act at Universal Studios. I legit feel really bad for the people in the suits. Apparently the piece of music that they had to listen to whilst doing this routine for 5 hours was a 2 minute long song on an endless loop. Like that's what hell was like before health and safety stepped in to stop it and told Satan he couldn't do that anymore. The show seems to have taken a lot of notes from the book of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles with a number of similarities. Monstrous looking protagonists, colour coded, youthful, fighting, themes of teamwork and friendship, and a desperate hope to cling on to youth culture. The show's plot revolves around three Martians, Tutti Frutti, Bebopé Luna, and Dua Diddy. Jesus fuck, my dad's too young for these references. Right, I'm just going to call them Mouthy, Brainy and Fatty from now on, because I legit can't remember what names belong to who. Yes, as my nickname implies, the three Martians each play a role, kind of like the Ninja Turtles. Unlike the Turtles though, there's only three of them. So Raphael and Michelangelo got the axe and were replaced by Fatty, who likes to eat. Well, to be fair, there's a little more to him than that, as he's the character with the most heart and he kind of acts as the muscle. It's just that these traits never really come in handy for the story, so him being fat is literally all they ever focus on. Unlike the Ninja Turtles, none of the Martians seem like they shine apart from the group. There are no solo episodes for any of these guys, or episodes where they have to be separated with one another, or another character like one of the kids or something, and build a bond with them. They all just sort of stick together all the time like conjoint twins, and any conflict that they do have feels incredibly forced because of this, since they're almost always on the same wavelength. Accompanying them are their three... Snacks? Pets? I don't know, but there's three smelly humans following them along for the ride. Mike, Cedric, and Angela. I have no idea how old these inferior life forms are, but I'm guessing that they're in the range of 16 to 19, as they're established as being in high school, and I believe this is set in America. And when I say guess, I mean hope as that would make the amount of aliens that want to bone Angela silly a little less, uh, yikes. I mean, it's yikes enough as it is, but Jesus Christ, if they're in British high school, I'm out. The three human characters have even less personality, with Mikey, that's Mike, whatever, being the main kid. 
He has parents who appear in the very first episode to establish that they are his parents, and then they leave. And then there's Angela and Cedric, who just seem to exist around him. Cedric seems to be a little more profit-oriented than these other guys, and Angela exists. She does have the personality of girl most of the time, like most characters with vaginas did in the early 2000s and uh, late 90s and sometime in the early 90s. Her thing is that a lot of evil aliens want to bone her. She gets liquefied in one episode, and fetish artists will go on to draw her likeness for decades after her show got cancelled. It's kind of funny, but with six main characters, there's somehow only enough personality to fit two main characters. Their few traits feel like base archetypes rather than character, and it's very rare that characters disagree with each other unless the plot demands it, in which case it feels kind of hollow and meaningless. If you compare them to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, for example, the four turtles have quite different personalities, different hobbies and stances on how things should be. They work well together, but there are episodes where Leonardo and Raphael butt heads, Donnie and Mikey test out some new tech, or they all team up to do something that they like. Also, due to their strong characters, it means that they're able to have solo arcs where they grow as people, like the episode where Leonardo has to get over having the shit kicked out of him, Raphael goes around New York trying to find someone, Michelangelo tries to become a superhero, and Donatello gets stuck in some weird fantasy world, all of which work for these characters, because they bring out their personalities a lot and show what they're like in a solo situation and how they handle it. Whereas, I can't really imagine something like this with the Martians. They do everything together, so there's no episodes like this, and I kinda hate that as it contributes to this show's biggest issue, which is the lack of story progression and the repetitiveness of the episodes. The actual plot of the show is that these Martians have arrived on the planet as an invasion force. Yes, three of them are supposed to subdue and conquer 10 billion people. Just roll with it. I wouldn't even mind either if these were like the best of the best, but as far as I can tell these Martians are adolescents themselves, or at least I hope so because one of them has a thing with Angela, which yeah if these Martians are like 400 years old that would be really fucking creepy and weird. But anyway, when they arrive on Earth they find out that it's actually a nice planet and that they kind of enjoy being on the planet and hanging out with the smelly humans. So they decide to settle down there, lying to their emperor about the invasion and fobbing him off with fake status reports, which are actually movies made on a green screen. I find this kind of funny that they never notice anything is post-produced. Like, they don't notice that the, like, attacks are CGI. I think you'd notice, unless CGI's gotten really fucking good in the future. Overall, though, I don't actually think that this is a bad premise for a comedic sci-fi show as it's not only kind of comedic within itself and breaks a few tropes, but it also gives for some comedic mileage on how they'd fake their progress. Honestly, I could see something similar being done in like a World War II setting or something like that. Something that would give off a lower low vibes or dad's army or something of that nature. But, you know, in a sci-fi setting, it would also work just as well. Hell, it might work better in some other avenues because faking things might be easier in some aspects but more difficult in others. However, the plot is actually the most crippling thing to this show in my opinion, and they have to work on this premise for 22 episodes, or 26 depending on which list you're looking at, and this actually results in the show being insufferably repetitive. You see, no matter what happens in an episode, they have to go back to maintaining the lie. It's the classic status quo is god thing. So every episode has to end with all changes being reverted and everyone just going back to the base premise. For 12 episodes, this might have been a bit more tolerable, but this series is 22 episodes long. 9 hours to watch everything in it, maybe 10 depending on if you have all the episodes, and nothing fucking changes from one episode to another. Episodes are so formulaic. Characters have some sort of problem and they resolve it by having a fight. That's it. Every episode. There's like one episode where the fight isn't the climax to the episode and something else happens. And even that involves fighting as part of the climax. It's just that they realize that they're fighting someone who's a bit like them so they let them go. 
The villain of the series is Emperor Bog, who is a whiny but ruthless dictator with an ego. He also has a Baxter Stockman-esque scientist at his beck and call, called Dr. Damage, pronounced as if it was French or something, who hates him, and seems to imply that he wants to betray him at some point. He actually does, but this doesn't really amount to much as it lasts for a single episode that I actually overlooked by accident, because it wasn't in the playlist that I used. Damage feels more like the primary antagonist, and I was hoping for a situation like Star vs. The Forces of Evil, where the main baddie is replaced by an even badder baddie, but that sadly just doesn't happen. Then there's the antagonist. Yeah, there's an antagonist as well as a villain, something that you don't really get as much in shows as I'd like. He's kind of like the Vegeta-esque character, I guess. I don't know, I don't watch One Piece. Meet StopeMuldoon.com, alien bounty hunter. Stoke Muldoon is the fucking man, and he's definitely my favourite thing about this show. He's a semi-competent alien hunter who has a TV show and wants to achieve fame and save the world. There are a few things that I like about this character. The first is that he's probably the most altruistic character in the entire show. He legitimately wants to protect the planet from alien invaders and has dedicated his entire life to building and purchasing crazy gadgets and he is constantly vigilant for any signs of alien scum who want to attack our planet. They originally put him forward as a Captain Quark-esque faker, but he's really not. There are several points in this series where he actually puts himself in harm's way to protect civilians and actually turns on his employers because he disagrees with their cruel and inhumane methods when dealing with the alien captives. Come with Mr. Muldoon, son. I'll take you back for milk, cookies, and debriefing. Chumpin' Jehoshaphat, what did those fiends do to your eyes? They're red. Heck, I can't lie to you, son. They're not just red. They're glowing red. Uh, I don't think that's Mike. I don't know what those Martians did to you, youngster, but I'll do what I can to help you. We're not going anywhere. It's another trap. How did you miss that one? Faulty Dr. Damage Tech strikes again. All right, aliens, hands up. Let the children go. We can work this out. Don't fear, children. I will protect you. And a very fine job you are doing. Get a clue, Muldoon. You're no match alone against Khufu. So either we become allies or Khufu kaboobs. And I see your point. So it looks like we'll be joining forces. Allies, compatriots, comrades. I believe it was Sun Tzu who said, the enemy of my enemy is my enemy in Miami. Yeah, right. Save it for your TV show, will you? Now, give me your little toy there. I think I can get us out of here. OK, but I warn you, no funny stuff. So, seen my show? Secret Lab or not, those young men are citizens of Earth, card-carrying members of the human race, and should be Do you really have to destroy it? Don't go weak on me, Muldoon. Well, at least let me get a photo first for my website. Stand back, you imbecile! This isn't right. It's just a poor little... <sighs> Don't just stand there. You won. Finish me off. That's not the way we do things down here, mister. We've got a better idea. You do? I was hoping to have him on my TV show and website. Well, actually, I was thinking of having all of you on. So I told Brady, even alien scum deserve to explain their unwelcome presence before they're sliced up like pastrami on rye. Oh, those words shall forever be written on my heart. You're a good man, a person, Ronald. I'm going back to the site. Hopefully, Dr. Hacksaw has come to his senses. They're as ridiculous as you are, Muldoon. Be that as it may, I can't let you take them, Hacksaw. Not until we're sure they really are aliens. Who's gonna stop me, Muldoon? You? An alien hunters got to do. What an alien hunters got to do. Draw, Muldoon. I said, draw, Muldoon. There is actually an episode that explores this character's backstory, which is funny because the writers seem to think that this was the only character whose backstory was worth exploring. 
It's actually my favourite episode of the series, I swear to Christ. One thing that's funny is we never actually get to see how the kids meet the Martians. Like, that's not important, but this guy's backstory is. In all honesty, I agree. I really like this character, so fuck it, let's just have his backstory. He's quite a principled man who actually had his career hobbled because he disagreed wholeheartedly with his mentor's viewed about alien life forms, believing him to be cruel and callous for wanting to capture and dissect any alien that he could get his hands on. Muldoon, on the other hand, just wants to keep them as POWs unless they prove that they're non-hostile or friendly, in which case he's just cool with them. Muldoon actually is needed in almost every episode because he has better gear and tech than the Martians and he's a formidable foe against most of the bad guys. He does a few stupid things here and there, but I do appreciate that most of the time he's being deliberately kept out of the loop by the Martians and is having to wing it. Hell, in several episodes, they actually label him as the president of Earth, painting a massive target on his back. And he's not agreed to this, they just do it randomly and hope for the best. Stone Muldoon has a number of flaws in his character as well, since he's kind of pig-headed, stubborn, and he has a bit of an ego. But to be fair, I think he kind of earned the ego. His flaws make him a bit more likeable to me because it makes him a stronger character overall. There's just one major flaw with his character, and it's a running gag that the show does with him in every single episode. Every time the Martians meet him, they wipe his memory. This is part of the status quo is god thing and it really does my tits in. At first it makes sense because in the first few episodes Stoke Muldoon is hostile towards them, but in later episodes it makes absolutely no sense when they explain that they aren't invaders and are actually here to protect the earth and Stoke Muldoon doesn't really have a problem with it. In fact, in the episode Kofu they actually strike an accord with Stoke Muldoon where he agrees to an alliance, so they wipe his memory and make him an enemy again. This is where I started to grow a little annoyed at this trope, because this was when I legit struggled to understand why this was even happening anymore. Also, I hope that the mind wipe doesn't have any negative side effects. I hope it's not like the retcon from Torchwood, because Stone Muldoon's probably going to murder a lot of people if it is. This stops this particular character from being able to grow or form a relationship with any of the other characters, which is yet another thing that makes the show tedious for long-term viewers, as there's no reward for sticking with the show. You just get to see them explain the show's plot to Muldoon 26 fucking times. I've watched the episodes you're seeing on the screen on Toonie Cartoonie's channel, which I'm thankful that this exists, as it means that I didn't have to pay to watch this shit. However, their playlist is seemingly incomplete, as it's missing two episodes, only one of which that I could find at all. Honestly, it doesn't seem to matter that much, as the only two episodes that make a difference in this series are episode 126 anyway, thanks to the fact that nothing is allowed to change until the end of season 1. What's especially annoying about this is the fact that the mid-season finale is actually better than the real season finale. Not only is it the only two-parter in this show's run, but the stakes are really ramped up. The characters have to amass a small army of everyone they've befriended over the course of the show's run, and they also have to defeat every villain that the show has thrown at them thus far. Honestly, if this ended around episode 12 or 13 with the final scene that episode 26 gave us, I think my review of it would have been a bit more favourable. Or even better if the second half of the season was the aftermath of this and now the truth was out and the Emperor was invading the planet so they actually had to gear up for war and fight him. Sadly this ends with them reverting back to lying to him and the show goes back to square one. Muldoon's mind gets wiped and so on and so forth. Would this show have been different in a post-Avatar or TMNT 2003 world? Possibly, hopefully even, but I guess we'll never know. One thing that this show gets ragged on a lot over is the animation, which I completely get since it's not the best looking show in the world, but I don't feel quite as strongly about it. It's far from perfect, but the character models are decent and expressive enough for the time. There's a lack of texture on anything, but I get the impression that it was more of a compromise so that the models could be better made and more expressive. The characters look okay for the most part. Like you can tell who most of the Martian characters roles are just by looking at them. 
This includes the Emperor and Damage, his scientist pal. The only Martian whose design I don't like is the female one, who looks a bit too different from her male counterparts for my liking. I feel like they often try to make female variants of species a bit too feminine, and therefore too human. This isn't the worst case of it, but it's kind of dumb that the men are all ugly, but this one female is as pretty as the designers could possibly make her. As far as humans go, they're kind of hit and miss. Stoke Muldoon and Ronald look pretty decent, and I'm pretty sure that Stoke is based off of his actor Robert Stack, who sadly passed away a year or two after BUM made it to screen. His voice acting is part of the character's charm, and it really is sad that such a talented guy passed away who'd been on our screens for decades at this point. Though admittedly he was in his 80s when this was made, so I doubt he'd be alive today regardless. Ronald looks like he sounds, so I kind of give his design a passing grade, but the main three, they're not outright terrible, but I can't quite tell how old they're supposed to be, and Cedric and Mike look a little too similar for my liking. Their character designs also seem a bit, like, weirdly ambiguous in some aspects. Like, I could legitimately see these characters being girls disguised as boys. Angela looks okay, but she looks like she's dressed for, I don't know, combat, burglary or something. My biggest issue with Angela is that her age is a bit too ambiguous. Her character is meant to be a late teenager from what I can tell, but I don't know how old she's meant to be. There's a scene in Damage's Little Girl, I think it's called, where it makes me feel a bit uncomfortable because I don't quite understand how old anyone is in the show. Like, I'm pretty sure Angela is a teenager since she's quite well developed, but I don't know how old these Martians are or what life stage they're at. Like, are they nonces in these scenes where they actually have, like, some flirtiness with Angela? Or are they just being horny teenage boys? It's hard as fuck to tell. Hell, they could even be like elves in the Tez series and not develop until their 20s or 30s. But this is never clarified. I'm going to assume, since this show isn't completely fucking weird for the most part, that they're like young conscripts. Though, that would make me question why three teenage boys were sent to conquer an entire planet which houses nuclear weapons and some brilliant militaries across the planet Scape. I mean, these aren't like Daleks where they're basically bulletproof and geniuses and capable of murdering entire populations as one individual. They are pretty fallible and capable of getting their asses handed to them if they're not good enough in a fight. So it does make me question why I only send three of them. I was actually counting animation errors for the most part, and other than a bit of clipping here and there, I didn't spot anything too egregious. I could have blinked and missed something, but I feel like the animators played it quite safe, minimalizing what was on screen to prevent any major fuck-ups from happening. One thing I've noticed is that there is a slow-mo effect whenever particles are used or too much is going on at once. I'm fairly certain that this is because the animation software would lag out anyway, so they just show it in slow motion to make it look like they did it instead of the computer having a stroke. The animation isn't stunning, even for the time, it's kind of basic bitch, but I don't feel like it was the worst that 3D computer animation had to offer. It gradually looks a little better the further into the series that you go because they kind of get used to using the lighting to hide the shittiness of it all, which I do appreciate. This is another thing as well that I feel like 12 episodes would have been better because they maybe could have made it look better, but instead they had to make 22 episodes, so you've got to stagger it out over the course of 22 episodes. You can only have so many models, so much rendering time, so much process. In all honesty, this definitely should have been a 12-part series, and I think they probably would have made something better. I do think that there might have been a number of production issues when it came to the animation, audio, and pacing, because of a few things that suggest this to me. There was one episode where a character just vanishes mid-chase. I'm not sure if this is just a bad transfer on the version that I watched like if i've got a bad copy or something 
or if this is actually an error in the show, as I was not really able to find another copy to compare it to. Another error in production that I noticed was in the Big Bash in Britain episode, the left audio channel goes fucking kaput for five minutes, so you can only hear out your right ear for a few scenes if you're wearing headphones before they arrive in England, and England saves us all by giving us a second audio channel back. Sour cream and flour flavored. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Rampant? Everybody down. Hello, what's all this then? Another thing that's kind of weird is these Austin Powers-esque transition sequences, which were kind of a staple of early 2000s and 90s movies and TV shows, in which they'd play some pointless animation or play a dumb editing effect over a scene to distract you for a moment, so you don't notice how abruptly the last scene ended. A few of these trigger mid-words, so the character barely finishes what they're saying before they move on to the next scene. For weeks. Come here. Oh, this is all my fault. Yes. Mike, come in, Mike. Mike, do you copy? Around. And BKM could stop him. Doesn't matter. What are the chances of a snarlick actually landing here on Earth? <laughs> Capture the Snarlick. At long last, the promised land, my first capture. Oh, a feisty one, eh? Well, save it for my TV show and website, StoatMuldoon.com. A world premiere simulcast. There's also some weird edits, like this one in the final episode where Fatty's face just becomes the picture with a caption of "aww," and I'm genuinely baffled at how anyone over the age of 10 can think this looks good. I feel that production gets better as the series progresses. The first episode has some baffling pacing when it comes to characters conversing with each other. Like, lines just seem to play one after another, and it feels very stilted and awkward. Open says me. I knew I smelled cheesemongers. Last time I tell you my password. Oh, look! TV! I love Earth TV. Hey, dog. Hey, Mike. Uh, man, that TV wouldn't be connected to a satellite dish by any chance, would it? N Whoa, hold it, aliens. <laughs> my parents are gone, okay? If you mess up, I won't be trusted alone until the next millennium. No problem. We just need to use your stuff for a minute. Yeah, he'll probably have it back to normal in no time. Probably? JT, <laughs> you want to get to work? Later episodes don't have this issue, so I guess this was just them finding their feet. But it really does have a sort of Rhapsody Street Kids or Dingo-esque vibe. It's not as bad as those. It's definitely better paced and everything than those, but it's still really stilted and weird. Something about the first episode feels uncanny as fuck, and it's not the animation as much as it's the pacing. Shit just happens one after another. The flow is jank as fuck. Most of the other stuff would be passable if the show was good. Like, I get that this was made in 2002 and a cheap 3D animation on television. Admittedly, this kind of hobbles it because 3D animation on television was kind of in its infancy at this point. Like, I don't think it was even a decade since the first one. And really, most of the ones you compare it to, like Donkey Kong Country and Vampires, don't exactly tower over this. In many respects, some of them are worse. I hear some decent things about Beast Wars, but again, the modelling in that is definitely the focus, and the textures are kind of, uh, well, hit and miss. However, most of the other shows did a better job of hiding how cheap they were with stylization and talent. But it might have been a bit more passable at the time had it not been for the fact that everything in this world looks like an early test build for a finished show, and the story is just a list of things that happen, jumping from one to another. That's the last time I tell you my password. It's Earth TV. Hey, dog. Really, this feels like something from the room. 
Some things are so clumsy and poorly edited together. Like, there's a scene where someone throws something and they have about six seconds to get out of the way. But it's clear that this was meant to take them by surprise, so it just looks really weird and stilted and awkward. There are a lot of early in-game sequences that come across as clumsy and offbeat. Exposition a lot of the time just gets dropped on us awkwardly or certain plot points or MacGuffins just appear out of nowhere. Another thing that I noticed was that there's a Captain Planet-esque transformation sequence that even starts with them holding up their rings of power, which they don't have, so they can conjure power armor and enter BKM, which is an anagram for butt-kicking mode. Butt-licking mode is literally just power armor, but they have to do this stupid animation, which is the exact same animation with the exact same monologue over it in every fucking episode so the animators can go and get a coffee break and still feel like they've done some work. One thing that gets on my tits about butt licking mode is that they can seemingly just use it when they want to. There's no limit set on it at all and they always wait until the mid fight point to pull it out and just hope that their enemies are sporting enough to just let them get prepared for battle whilst monologuing mid fight. Still, I don't know why they just don't start all their fights in BLM, as there's literally no advantage that they can gain by not doing so. There's no restriction, there's no limited time, it's not like the Metaforce from Metabots or Kamehameha from Dragon Ball where it has to build up over the course of the fight. They literally can just turn up and shout BKM and put their power armor on and fight. However, for some reason, they always wait until the midpoint of the episode to do this. I mean, I do know the actual reason, but I mean, in-universe, it makes no sense. Still, they could have just done this before the fight, so that they could do their stupid monologue off-screen, and reduce the chance of me hearing it in my dreams just that little bit more. But they won't, because they're evil and sadistic. Speaking of which, I fucking hate the theme song to this show. Because it's not good, but it gets stuck in your fucking head. We are the Martians, the Bud Ugly Martians. We are the Martians, the Bud Ugly Martians. We don't really want a war. I just want a hoverboard. We don't want to conquer Earth. I just want to fill my girth. We are the Martians, the Bud Ugly Martians. We are the Martians, the Bud Ugly Martians. Wait. No. No, this is crazy. This also has what I like to call Metabot Syndrome, where they're using outdated technology in the year 2060. It's very retro-futuristic, but not in the kind of way that, say, Fallout is, where it's actually thought out and well-designed. It's just that they never thought that people might move on from DVDs at some point, so everyone uses DVDs in the 2060s, or they're using CRT televisions or whatever. By the way, the estimated year in this is 2060, I don't think it's outright said in the show, but in one episode, they say that the planet has 10 billion people on it, which, according to projected figures, suggests that this is 2060. Though this does clash with another episode, where there's apparently 6 billion people on the planet now. So either this is now set in the year 2000, or there was some horrific pandemic that wiped out 4 billion people between episodes, and they just didn't think it was worth bringing up. One of the BUM novels that I own begins by telling us that the year is 2053. So, yeah, your guess is as good as mine. I mean, 2053 is the novel's canon, but the show might be a bit different. I'll say 2060 to be safe. What the fuck is this picture on the wall? Yeah, how many of you just have pictures of yourself looking like you don't have a fucking clue what you're doing on your wall? I have to be selective these days about how many I have, because I just had way too many at one point. 
Speaking of the global populace, I kind of noticed how few background characters there are in this series. Like, there are no pedestrians or passing vehicles, and it makes the world feel so empty. It's like a Gmod map that only has a few NPCs or ragdolls spawned in it. At times, it feels like there are only these characters in the world, and they don't seem to be any other models on the streets, and a few characters don't even have models and are just disembodied voices, such as Dark Comet and Mike's mother. Dark Comet is a character who's in it for a few episodes, and then you never hear from him again for reasons I don't quite get. They made a bunch of models for the Alien Tavern and a crowd of the British Bash, but you can tell that they just cut a few corners on the latter. The aliens in the tavern look okay for the series and they only appear in a couple of episodes, but it's weird that they went through the effort to make these guys but none of the human populace. Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius looked a fair bit better than But Ugly Martians and it had a lot of the issues that I had with But Ugly Martians fixed. That show came out only a year after this one did, and on the same network, and also, weirdly, co-stars Rob Paulson. Why the fuck is Rob Paulson in everything that I watch or even reference lately? I mean, I'm not complaining, it's just starting to feel like some weird curse or something right now. This scene is bafflingly bad because their plan is to impersonate the Emperor over the PA system, whilst the guard that they are tricking is right in front of them. Obviously they see their lips moving and hear him say this shit. Jesus fuck. Uh, attention marching soldiers. Uh, this is your Emperor Bob. Uh, release the prisoners at once and return to the uh, bridge. <laughs> what can I say? That was too easy. But you want to hear my Elvis impersonation, man? Yeah. So, the show's finale ends on a kind of frustrating note. Like I said, they finally let the cat out of the bag about the whole fake invasion thing, and the Emperor just comes to attack them. They beat him and let him go, knowing that he won't uphold his end of the bargain, not coming back to Earth. But Stoat Muldoon, Giga Chad, turns up with a fucking laser bazooka and blasts him out the sky like a total fucking badass. I would have ended the series right here, to be honest, but they needed a sequel hook, so the Emperor appears on TV and tells them that the Emperor that they blew up was actually a robotic double. I personally think that Damage being the robotic fake and the real Emperor Bog being there would have made things more interesting. Like, Damage could have pulled like a war master and have been able to take the throne and would have had real justification for doing so and nobody could blame him for someone else killing the Emperor as he was leaving. Like, he'd have a convenient case where the Emperor was killed and he survives, but he wouldn't be blamed for it. Still, it ends with the Martian invasion fleet attacking the Earth, only now it's a good thing because, I don't know, 26 episodes have happened, so we've got to change the tone of things somehow. Honestly, a more definitive ending would have been nicer, but you hardly ever get those on TV shows. When it comes to comedy, I feel like this show misses a lot more than it hits, but I feel like it has hit on occasion, which is at least something. There's a bit of emphasis on toilet humour in the earlier episodes, which all seems to drop by the midpoint of the season completely. I'm glad, because it's not very funny, or even well done in its sphere. Most of the funny bits, what few there are, come from either good delivery, or one or two decently written lines, both of which caught me off guard, and some of them even feel like accidents. I did a tally of terrible jokes and terrible humour that made me cringe, and admittedly there wasn't that much of it, as, not as much as I was expecting anyway. A lot of it just replaced random words with Martian lingo, because that equals funny apparently. I'd give it more shit for that, but Destroy All Humans does the same thing, so I'd have to hate that game as well, and in truth I don't, so... I mean, that game's not very funny either, but you know. There's another thing where the Martian characters talk backwards, and I don't really know why. Done. He was here. I was in him. No, it's not your old nobody alien. He will throw on. Say bye bye. That thing, all Earth will be annihilated when Gorgon gets done. Might as well. 
that's not like the Martian language or anything. It's just a weird ability that they can do. Thankfully, for the power of editing, I can translate what they're saying. It's pointless, but I can do it. One thing that I find kind of funny is how the British Bash episode, the writer seemingly just wants to make his opinion on charity singles known. And I do kind of find it funny how the whole episode revolves around this one opinion. Like, throughout the entire episode, they just shit on stuff like Live Aid in what's meant to be a kid's show. Like, do any kids even know what the fuck they're on about? Although I may look different, weird or strange and not like you. You know I am your brother, even though my skin is blue. And just like all those rock stars, for the money we won't bring. Yeah, we want to save the planet, but all we ever do is sing. Lord Hassenfeffer and his bombastic periwinkles. All right, aliens, time to pay the piper. Oh, wait, this is from the blokes in the funny suits. Here, catch! Why can't you be the Queen Mum? Oh my, I do say. What's happened to this chap? Hold on, what's happened to me? I'm, I'm suddenly coherent. Yes, and I like it. Each of us must do our part and give until it hurts. You know, we can stop all war and hunger if we set it up. As far as legacy goes, this show has virtually none. It's been memed a little, but it's hard to meme because it's a bit too competent for that. But I think it's too crap to legitimately enjoy. It's a very middling affair. The most memed episode, I think, is That's Not a Puddle, That's Angela, in which Angela is liquefied and turned into a puddle. I honestly don't know if people like this because of the ridiculousness of its plot, or if being liquefied is some sort of fetish. Oh, and yes, there is a fair bit of fetish art based around Angela. Not as much as I'd feared, but more than I'd hoped. Anyway, this episode is a good one to bring up, because every episode of this show was novelized into a book. I find it kind of funny that Angela and Stoke Muldoon have a lot of detailing on their models on the front cover, and they actually look a lot better than they did in the show. One thing that's interesting about these novels, beside the additional backstory that you get at the start of them, is that the illustrations are in 2D rather than 3D, so you get a kind of nice what-if as to how this would have looked if this was a traditional cartoon. I would have liked it a little more if all of these were actually drawn images, but a lot of these just seem to be vectored stills from the show. Some of the characters look a bit doofy in these illustrations, like how these guys react to being fucking melted, but I do appreciate that the illustrations are there. I also like how this guy's just got a big grin on his face as he jumps out of a wormhole. StokeMuldoon.com actually has an illustration. Fucking yes. By the way, StokeMuldoon.com did actually exist as a website tied to the BUM brand, but it sadly no longer exists. You can buy the domain, 
which I hope someone does and reinstates the original site because that would make my day. You can make stopemuldoon.com on the way back machine, but due to Flash players dying out and even alternatives that I find just don't seem to work anymore, it's pretty much dead. Like, it's hard to see what it originally looked like. Anyway, it only lasted a year before it was an advertisement for the video games attached to this series, and that lasted until around 2007, I believe, when Vivendi and Sierra both died and, well, they basically just deleted all their sites. There are a few people who have made fan art about this show, and the collectibles are available online in some capacity, but few if any people actually want them because... Well, the toys are pretty shittily made and the show they're based on sucked, so why would they? But hey, if you want a doofy-eyed Angela on your desk, then go for it, you probable pervert. I personally will be ordering myself this but ugly Martian's duvet cover and pillowcase. I'm sure my girlfriend will be fucking thrilled when this thing turns up one morning. To conclude, I do think but ugly Martians has some saving graces but not enough to make the show legitimately enjoyable or good. It did feel like a bit of a chore to sit through this entire series. Hell, when the two-parter came up, I kind of ironically got into it, but then it got boring again, because after the two-parter, it's just the same shit all over again. And it just, it's like, oh my god, this show just fucking do something that's not the same shit all over again. It really does kind of lack in most areas, and it's kind of sad because there is a lot of talent that went into this series, particularly in the voice work, which I actually think sounds decent. In fact, no, it sounds fucking great in some points. The Alien Hunter is voiced by Robert Stack, as established, who has a fair few credits under his name, ranging from Airplane to Caddyshack 2. I still think that Caddyshack 2 was a bit of a shittier thing to be in, but, well, you're welcome to debate that. He does a really good job, but I honestly think that his voice sounds a bit older than his character at times. The dude was 83 when he did this part, so I don't blame him. I just don't get why they couldn't have grade the character's hair a little to make him match better. A lot of the other characters sound a bit older than they should, particularly the kids. But the voice acting, apart from that, is really good. You've got Mike, who's voiced by Rob Paulson, who voiced Raphael in the 80s Ninja Turtles show. You've got Kath Saucy, who voiced a lot of characters, such as Phil and Lil from Rugrats and Kanga in some of the Winnie the Pooh movies. And then you've got Oogie Banks, or Oogie Banks, who voiced Firestorm in Injustice 2, Preston Garvey's impersonator in Fallout 4, and I think he voiced Rob in Britney's Dance Beat. Those are some real blasts of the past, I have to admit. Rob Paulson also voices the Brainy Martian, and I do have to admit, he does a decent job of making him sound like a different character for the most part. I also appreciate as well that a major Transformers veteran voices the fat one, and his performance actually contributes, in my opinion, to him being the most likable Martian. We've also got Charlie Schlatter, or Schlater. I'm going to go with Schlatter because there's two Ts. But he also voiced Kick Butowski in Suburban Daredevil, which I had not heard of until now, but it lasted for two years, so make what you will, I guess. I do really like and appreciate the show's cast, minus a few of the age issues that come with it, but admittedly some of the characters do sound a bit too similar to each other, partly because they share actors and partly because, well, they kind of just had a singular idea as to what Martians and humans even should sound like. I have seen worse shows than this, but admittedly this really couldn't have had a long life as a show. It just generally lacks any real depth or reason to watch it. The longer you do watch it, the more you just feel bad for having wasted your life on it. It just has so little to offer, 
it's like junk food for the brain. And you honestly could have enjoyed shows like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or Shaolin Showdown or something of that vein that came out around the same time. It's a fun little curiosity that time forgot. But I'd be lying if I said that time should ever unforget this anytime soon. <laughs> and everything in its place. <laughs> oh, somebody got my award dirty. Mm. Marshmallow, my favorite. <laughs> Hello, beautiful night, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs>